Hello, my name is Rick Pearson, and I'd like to welcome you to this first of a series of seven prophetic teachings entitled The American Revelation. You know, the Bible consists of 66 books written by 40 authors covering a period of 1,500 years. It's been both written and studied by kings, prophets, priests, scholars, and laity worldwide. Since the 1500s, Holy Scripture has been translated into over 4,800 languages, reproduced to almost 6 billion copies, and continues to be the number one bestseller annually around the globe. To this date, it remains the most studied, redacted, and translated book ever written by mankind. But historically, the most difficult and controversial book to understand within biblical literature is the book of Revelation. It is the final 22 chapters of Scripture that declares the end time scenario of what man will observe immediately before the second coming of Christ. Revelation describes a vivid picture of the seven churches that will exist immediately before a great worldwide tribulation occurs. It showcases the most powerful, wealthiest, and intelligent nation the world has ever conceived. However, that nation, according to the book of Revelation, will be destroyed by a fiery judgment immediately before 17 tribulation plagues are released across the earth. Within its content, Revelation warns of a world leader and a government that will be raised up within that seven-year period of global upheaval. It will be a time of tribulation that Jesus described in Matthew 25 as the worst mankind has ever known, only to be ended by his second coming. The book of Revelation, as mentioned, is one of the most complicated books of the Bible to interpret. Its pictorial language, multiple visions, and prophetic symbology are open to a multitude of interpretations. From this foundation, we should begin our study by agreeing on three absolute concrete principles. Number one, there is a God. Number two, I'm not him. And number three, neither are you. From this precedent, there will always be three interpretations of scripture. God's interpretation, my interpretation, and your interpretation. As believers in Christ, our only goal is to find God's interpretation. So in studying this book, we're going to utilize two vital theological tools. First is exegesis. Exegesis says, what was God trying to say through the mind of the author then and there? 2 Peter 1.21 says, For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The second tool we're going to use is hermeneutics. Hermeneutics asks the question, what is God trying to tell us through these men in the here and now? Remember, the same Holy Spirit who spoke then and there is the same Holy Spirit who reveals his secrets in the here and now. Many times, however, as in Daniel's case, he did not understand the things that were spoken to him. Daniel 12, 8 says, I, Daniel, heard, but I did not understand. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Revelation 1.1 states, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus. Verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Let's begin our study by first looking at the author of this incredible book. John the Beloved was youngest of the twelve disciples, an eyewitness to Jesus' miracle ministry. He was known as being the apostle of love. John was the younger brother of James, who were both partners in a fishing business with Peter and Andrew. Jesus once called James and John the sons of thunder, sons of thunder because they wanted to call down fire on a town in Samaria who rejected the gospel. James and John's mother, Salome, was Mary's sister, making them first cousins to Jesus. John was also second cousins to John the Baptist, of whom he was a follower. John took care of Jesus' mother at the crucifixion, in fact, he was the only disciple who witnessed that event 
And some believe Mary went to Ephesus in her later years to be with John. He lived in Jerusalem for 12 years after the crucifixion until persecution began. Then he moved to Ephesus where he pastored the church of Ephesus and traveled to surrounding villages preaching the gospel and starting new churches throughout the region. John wrote a total of five books in the Bible. He wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd Epistles of John, and finally, in approximately 70 to 85 AD, he wrote the book of Revelation. Throughout John's life, he either witnessed or heard of the other disciples' deaths that came about through their persecuted lives. For example, Nathaniel was flogged and crucified. James died of the sword. Thomas was speared and burned to death. Judas was beaten to death with sticks. And Matthias was stoned to death on a cross. James was cast from a temple roof and then beaten. Andrew, Philip, and Simon were all crucified. And Peter was crucified upside down because he did not feel worthy to die like Jesus. Now all these brutal deaths occurred because the disciples would not deny seeing the miracles, the healings, or the message that Jesus Christ preached, emphasizing that he was the Son of God. And even today, we see the same brutal persecution coming from certain religions who deny Christ's deity and will kill any believer who dares to preach the gospel of Christ. John was the last apostle to die at 94 years age and was the only apostle that died of natural causes. Where was this book written? According to the early church father Tertullian, John was banished to the Isle of Patmos after being plunged into boiling oil in Rome and suffering nothing from it. This event would have occurred during the reign of Roman Emperor Domitian, who was known for his persecution of Christians in the late first century. The Isle of Patmos was an island in the Aegean Sea where he wrote the entire book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was written in approximately 70 to 85 AD, but by 1227 AD, together with the entire New Testament, the book was divided into 22 chapters. That tradition continued with the first Wycliffe English Bible translation in 1385 and continues today for all modern translations. How was this book written? Revelation was given to John in the apocalyptic language of metaphors, visions, and spiritual symbolism. John was visited by angels and even Christ himself who told John to write the book for the end times. It's a book whose interpretations must be interpreted not only with the exegesis of scripture, what was in the mind of the author then and there, but also with the hermeneutical interpretation what does the scripture say to us today in the here and now? Isaiah 46 states, I am God and there is none like me, speaking the end from the beginning. Since the Bible predicts the end from the beginning, we must ask the question, where are we in scripture? Can we find the page or the chapter and verse where our generation fits between Genesis 1-1 and Revelations chapter 22, verse 21. Now the purpose of Revelation was to speak to future generations of what believers should look for before the second coming of Christ takes place. However, the vision of things to come were not given to John in chronological order. Therefore, you cannot read chapter 1 through 22 consecutively and understand the order of events that will take place. Just as the Bible is not written in chronological order, neither was the book of Revelation. However, today, we're going to dissect this book, and at the end of this series, I believe you will see exactly where we stand on the prophetic time clock of God's schedule. Now, to whom was this book written and why? Revelation was written specifically to the seven churches or types of believers during the end times. It was a warning to them, a warning of specific sins that would keep them from being worthy 
to escape the great tribulation that was about to come on the church. Upon this premise, we understand that Jesus' visitation with John was given that his sheep or believers, which we call the church, would understand the times in which they were living and give them clarity how they could escape the worst seven-year period on earth that would take place immediately before Jesus returned. We said that Revelation has 22 chapters in all. And for the sake of simplicity, we can divide the 22 chapters into seven specific teaching sections of the book. Chapters 1 through 3 is a description of the seven distinct churches or types of believers that will be living immediately before a great seven-year tribulation covers the earth. Chapters 4 and 5 gives us John's personal testimony of how Jesus and multiple angels appeared to him, giving him a pictorial, or pictorial narration of things to come through various visions he received. Verses 6 through 16 is a description of the seven-year tribulation period together with the 21 plagues that will cover the earth, ending with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Chapter 17 and 18 is a description of a providential nation that will be destroyed the first day of the tribulation period. Chapter 19 is a description of heaven's activities while the tribulation takes place. Verse 20 is a description of the millennial reign of Christ after the tribulation ends. Verses, or chapters 21 and 22 finally is a description of the new heavens and the new earth that will come to this planet. Just as the Bible has not been recorded in chronological order, neither was the book of Revelation given to John in chronological order. For us to understand this book, we must rearrange the chapters to put them into the sequential order of events as John described them. In doing so, we'll be able to literally pinpoint specific providential nations that God has raised up in our lifetime to fulfill His sure word of prophecy. And through this process, we will be able to see the world stage that is now set for a one-day cataclysmic event that will allow every prophetic word that John records to be fulfilled over the following seven years. Chapters 1 through 3, I already mentioned, describes the pre-tribulation environment, showing us what the world looks like before the tribulation begins. In these chapters, Jesus describes seven types of believers within the church. Some he commends and others he warns that certain sins that will invade their lives and we will also discover that not all Christians will escape the tribulation period, but will be tested to go through it. Verses 4 and 5, John explains how he received the revelation that Jesus gave him. But verses 17 and 18 describe the initial event that begins the tribulation period. This will be the first nation the Antichrist destroys in order to gain world domination. From verses 6 through 16, after that nation is destroyed, it will initiate the seven judgments, or excuse me, the seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls, or 17 plagues that will cover the earth, literally killing one-third of mankind. That number is 2.1 billion today, through pestilence, war, and starvation. Finally, in verse 19, after the tribulation, it deals with the events happening in heaven while the tribulation occurs on earth. Those chosen from the seven churches, called the Bride of Christ, will be celebrating in heaven the marriage supper of the Lamb. It is a seven-year celebration ended by the second coming of Christ, who will appear with ten thousands of his saints. Verse 20 describes a 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ after the tribulation. And finally, chapters 21 and 22 describes a new heavens and a new earth after the millennium. So before we begin the, teaching, the teachings concerning the seven churches, we must lay a firm foundation of exactly what the church is. In Matthew 6, 18, Jesus asked Peter, 
who do men say that I am? And Peter responded, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. Jesus in this passage was not talking about build a building, but was referring to a special type of knowledge, a knowledge referred to by Paul as revelation knowledge. He told his disciples, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. John 10, 27 says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Paul explains in Ephesians 3 how that by revelation, God made known unto me the mystery of the gospel. So the church is not a building. It's the people in the building. Buildings cannot hear a voice. People can. The church Jesus is referring to are people who literally hear and receive personal revelation knowledge from God. In other words, Without a personal revelation of Christ in one's life, you cannot know Christ. You can read the Bible, you can study the Bible, you can even argue the Bible. But until you personally meet the author, the point is moot. Jesus said you must be born again. You must have a spiritual awakening in your life that gives you concrete evidence that demands a verdict. And that verdict is that Jesus is the Son of God He's your savior, he's your healer, and according to the book of Revelation, he's your soon and coming king. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. We must remember this principle as Jesus addresses the seven churches or the seven types of believers in the following chapters. Paul gives us early warnings of the tribulation and says that there will be a falling away. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 2 says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as it is from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no man deceive you by any means, for the day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The word apostasia in Greek is the falling away Paul was referring to. It means to rise up in open defiance of authority with the presumed intention to overthrow it or to act in complete opposition to its demands. The apostasia is an open defiance of God's word or authority. David said, thy word have I hidden mine heart that I might not sin against thee. First John 2 18 says, ye have heard that antichrist shall come even now are the many antichrists. Verse 22 says, He that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can cometh unto the Father but by me. The Bible describes two areas of authority where the apostasia or the falling away will take place. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament says that the apostasia affects two arenas of influence. The first is a political authority, and the second arena is a spiritual authority. The political authority is based on Romans 13, 1 through 8, where it says, Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. The powers that be are ordained by God. Who resisteth the power? resisteth the ordinance of God. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. For he, the rulers or government, are ministers of God to thee for good. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So police, courts, 
jails are all used to hold back evil on the earth. Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 15, it says that God will exalt a nation that obeys his commandments. And we will discuss this in much greater detail in the following lessons. However, the bottom line is that when a nation exalts God's laws, it forms a covenant similar to Israel's covenant with God. A covenant is an agreement between two parties, each of which meets certain responsibilities and both receive certain benefits from that covenant. Any person, group, or worshipers, or even a nation who forms a covenant agreement with God, according to God's word, receives the covenant blessings. Those blessings include divine guidance, divine protection, and divine provision. The coming world dictator will refuse to allow any covenant based on God's word into his new world order. Daniel 7.25 says, And he, the Antichrist, will speak great words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. The first arena of apostasia is government while the second arena of apostasia is of a spiritual nature. From this apostasia, Jesus confirms with Paul that a great number of believers will also fall away from the commandments or tenets of the faith before the Antichrist rises to world domination. This specifically has to do with sound doctrine or the authority that the word has over a believer's lifestyle. 2 Timothy 3.16 reads, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, But the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap unto themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn their ears from the truth. 2 Peter 2.1 says, There shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And through covetousness shall they be feigned words, make merchandise of you. These are leaders more interested in fleecing the flock than feeding the sheep. In chapters 2 and 3, Jesus shows us several examples of how apostasia will infiltrate his church in the last days. These warnings are speaking directly to modern day believers before a great tribulation comes to the world. Jesus ends every address to the believers with he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Obviously, many are not hearing nor seeing the signs of the times for his coming. And it should be noted he is warning believers, not unbelievers. So if we are coming near to the tribulation period, Jesus is speaking directly to you and me. In our next series, we will deal specifically with each apostasia or falling away or sin that will try and influence both you and me in these last days.